This is a fit mess with Zach and Jeremy. Feelings are messy. Talking about them often gets even messier. But that's what we'll be attempting to do on this edition of the Fit Mess. Uh, I'm Jeremy, and uh, along with me as usual is Zach. What's up, everyone? And Zach, how, I, I guess we got to start with the big question on this uh, this episode. How do you feel? It's a good question because I'm not entirely sure. Really? Do you, do you need a minute? Do you need to, to <laughs> pause and reflect and look inward to, to find the answer? I do actually. It it takes me a minute to to break it down. I not to. I mean, let let's jump right off the deep end and go into the the heavy stuff. But you know, like I as a child, I was uh, we will say encouraged to not feel anything, right? I wasn't allowed to be sad or mad or I mean, really even happy. So when it hit me a long time ago, that was like when someone's like, Hey, how do you know how to, when you're feeling happy? And I, I, I couldn't answer them and I didn't know what it was like to feel happy. Like, and, and then I thought about it and I didn't really, I couldn't explain what it was to feel sad. I couldn't explain what it was to, to feel these emotions. And I, realize that I had a real big disconnect between, you know, my actual emotions and and being able to name them. It was weird. That's, that's interesting. And that is something that is, uh, is also really a a new, um, uh, skill, I guess that I'm working on. And to, to the normal listener right now, I would imagine there's tons of people just going, what the hell are you talking about? Like, how do you not know when you feel happy? How do you not know when you're sad? Like typically the, the big, uh, tears pouring down your face while you're crying. That's when you're sad. Mm-hmm. Sure. But what are you sad about? What is what is the actual root feeling? And it's so easy to get caught up in the story of the thing that happened. And that's why you're upset without looking a little bit deeper and peeling a layer back and figuring out what feeling is this triggering uh, and, and how do I cope with that? Because if you get stuck in the story, you can't really resolve it. There's tons of, of deeper things that go on that trigger whatever emotion we're feeling, positive or negative. And when you don't identify it, it's really easy to let it sort of take you over, I think is the point mm-hmm. I'm trying to make. Take you over or or just run through your life, you know, just just doing the motions, right? Right. Um, or or you get to a point where, like you were saying, or and, and like I've experienced, not even knowing what the emotion is. Because you yeah. aren't taught how to deal with it, you aren't given room to express it. There's no one holds the space for you to just fully experience that feeling. And and it's funny you're talking about, you know, we, I was teasing you about needing a moment to reflect and and to find the feeling. That's something that I need to do a lot, and I don't do it typically until I'm like on the bus on the way to my therapist's office when I have a few minutes to go. Okay, what am I what am I dealing with right now? What do I need to talk to my therapist about today? Yep. And that's a conversation that I should be having with myself every morning. Like I should just start the day with how am I feeling? What am I, you know, what challenges am I facing today and how do I feel about them? But you get so caught up in the rat race and the, and the time crunch and all the responsibilities that you just go through the motions as like, you know, robotically until you just crash and burn at the end of the night. Yeah, and even if you're not identifying the feelings that you're having, they're still having an impact, right? Yeah. I mean, I always thought my feelings and emotions were pretty normal. Um, turns out my anxiety is like off the charts. So like I just thought it was normal and I wouldn't really acknowledge it or deal with it. And it just built up and built up and it like ended up turning into, you know, physical ailments. It presented itself as physical ailments and mm-hmm. it learning how to recognize the emotions, deal with them appropriately lots of deep breathing and you know all of a sudden those physical ailments have been going away but man like when you don't know what your feelings are and you you try and figure that out it's like learning chinese well and it's you know it's so always funny when we have these conversations how much it triggers a lot of root stuff for me And, and just now hearing you talk about the physical ailments as a kid growing up i dealt with asthma a bunch uh i missed a lot of school because i was sick but just with a kind of a general illness. And it was weird because by the end of the day, I would typically feel better. And mm-hmm. I do think that a lot of the stress that I was under as a kid, you know, growing up in the environment that I was growing up in, just the normal stress of being a kid and, you know, going through school and, and all that stuff, although simpler then, I think, than it is now, was something that I didn't know how to manage. And it came out as I'm sick, I want attention, and I just want to not be around people. So I want to be home today alone by myself. 
Yep. And that ultimately, it's so weird. Like I'm just literally, as we're having this conversation, I'm just making the connection to how that translated into depression through my early adulthood and, and most of my life is that I, not knowing how to cope with my feelings, I push myself to a point of overwhelm and I shut down in a depressed state and typically try to hide and not be around people and not cope uh, and just sort of ride it out until my, you know, my energy's uh, replenished and I can start again. Mm -hmm. And it's only in the last few years really that I've identified that and it really most explicitly kind of right now, but only recently have I realized that by learning how to deal with my emotions, that's going to be the most effective way to push back against that condition against, you know, depression and anxiety. Yeah. The interesting thing about emotions is that, you know, we, we can try and shove them down and not feel them, but it's going to build up and cause other problems. And it, it, again, it took me a long time to realize, but I need to actually feel them, identify them and deal with them. And only then is the, you know, that that's the only time you're going to make progress is when you can understand your own emotions but how do you do that, Zach? Who has the answers? Who knows how to actually identify your feelings and process them and deal with them in a, in a healthy way? T t turns out we found a guy. We, we, we know a guy that uh, knows a thing or two. His name is Dr. Mark Brackett. He is the founding director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, which, by the way, I didn't know existed. The fact that that exists at Yale is fantastic, and I, I had no idea. So that, that was a, the first thing I learned uh, in reading his new book, uh, Dr. Brackett's book is Permission to Feel, Unlocking the Power and Emotions to Help Our Kids, Ourselves, and Our Society Thrive. And we had to start with the obvious question. How do you feel? <laughs> well, it's five o'clock and I've been, I did about three interviews today and i um, running around New York City and begged a friend of mine to let me park in their beautiful office near Grand Central Station. So I'm feeling Relieved, overwhelmed, and uh, excited. Oh, good, good. Well, good for you for being uh, aware of your feelings and being able to uh, to name them. That's uh, not easy for a lot of us. I wanna uh, I wanna start by asking you about uh, the title of your book, Permission to Feel. the The title really struck me because this is something that I've been doing a lot of uh, work on personally through lots of therapy and things I've been working on in the last couple of years. Uh, just really trying to allow myself to feel, but also being able to figure out what those feelings are. Is that a weird thing to hear coming from a man in his 40s? You know, it's not. I think that, you know, we have not given our kids or ourselves the permission to feel. And uh, it's the reason why I wrote the book. Emotional intelligence, you know, has been around for, I don't know, 30 years. But people still struggle sharing how they're feeling, finding words to describe their feelings. And certainly many people struggle with the strategies to regulate them. I guess why why now are we starting to finally pay attention to this? Because I think that there are a variety of things happening in our culture. One, people are burnt out at work, and disengagement is at you know all time highs. The second is the anxiety and stress levels in our nation are at all time highs. Uh, bullying is still a problem in our schools, you know, and the list goes on. You know, that all kind of come together you know, in terms of why we need these skills now more than ever. What was the reason for writing this book for you? Is It seems like it was a very personal work for you. It was. Um, you know, I suffered quite a bit as a kid um, and didn't have the permission to talk about my feelings. And it led to a lot of self-hatred. It led, it led to shame. It led to, you know, eating problems. And the list goes on. And... You know, I was lucky that I had this uncle who was just this miracle who, you know, was writing a program about kids' feelings in the 1970s and 80s. And he was the only adult who gave me the permission to feel because he just asked me the simple question, how are you feeling? And didn't judge me for what I said, but listened and said, all right, what are we going to do about it together? That's such a, an amazing question, right? I mean, the uh, uh, I. In reading through your book, I realized that, like, I, I don't think I ever heard that question when I was a kid. So that that's just reading that first part of the book was was really hit close to home here. So 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 what is it like to go from, you know, not feeling to to having permission to feel? 
Yeah, so I think it's liberating because, you know, we all have feelings. Whether we, you know, whether we think they're good or bad, um, they're all there. And importantly, in our center, we say there's no such thing as a bad feeling, right? Feelings are just feelings. They come and they go, and sometimes they stay for longer than you want them to, but they're information. And I think, you know, what's critical is that we have the conditions, meaning the context, the people with whom we can talk about emotions, but also importantly, we know we get granular, like we know the words instead of being angst or upset or stressed, which really have no meaning. um, When we get granular and we can say, you know, I'm really disappointed or I'm frustrated or I'm overwhelmed or I'm um, feeling hopeless. um, It, it gives you an opening to a think about the cause of that feeling and B strategies to regulate it effectively. Something I think is interesting, just, to, you know, kind of echoing what Zach said, a lot of what you write about in the book really, um, I could relate to a lot. I had an aunt that was very much the same way, not necessarily asking how I was feeling, but just really trying to step in and fill a void that wasn't there uh, or that was there because of, you know, parents working a lot or, or away, you know, when after school situations, things like that. Um, so I, I, I really connected with you in that way, but also as a parent talking about dealing with our kids emotions. And this is something that I also struggle with. And I think a lot of it is similar to what my parents went through is it's just, none of us have the time. I think it takes a, a dedicated decision and, and, you know, a real amount of time to talk to kids about their feelings. It's so easy to dismiss them when they're just having a tantrum over dropping their lollipop or something that seems really trivial to an adult where you're like, what's the big deal? Just get another one. But to them, it's this huge thing and they're trying to figure out how to process it. And so, you know, when you talk about uh, be- between being an emotional, uh, what is it, an emotion scientist uh, versus an, emo- an emotion judge, that's, I really yep. walk that line a lot because I'm aware that I need to take the time and I, I'm aware how, of how important it is to identify those feelings. Mm-hmm. But I really struggle with the time because so much, so often it's I'm in between this. We got to get to that. We got to get to school. Whatever. That seems like that is a, a big challenge for a lot of parents uh, trying to cope with this. It is. That's why we just want our kids to be fine, right, and happy, because then we don't have to stop and pause and problem solve. Unfortunately, our kids are not fine. Oftentimes, as I was not fine as a kid, and I think that part of the struggle is I'll give you an example. So somebody came up to me recently and said, "I'm reading your book and." Yeah, we talked. We started talking about it, you know, at dinner. And my son, he called me, you know, at work today, and he said, uh, "You know, mom, I'm feeling really nervous." And the woman said to me, "But you know, my son has never told me how he felt." And so when he told me he was nervous, I didn't know what to do about it. She goes, "I didn't get to that chapter yet." <laughs> <laughs> and I thought to myself, "You're his mother, um, you know, like your son tells you he's nervous, but yet she felt stuck." You know, she didn't know how to comfort him. She was, she got nervous that her son was nervous. And, you know, it blows my mind, you know, how um, uncomfortable we are about feeling and how limited we are in terms of our ability to help people regulate. Well, and and I think it's so interesting, too, that I think you touch on the idea of, of asking a lot of questions and not necessarily having the answers, not necessarily knowing how to deal with whatever the thing is. But but by exploring and, and being curious about where those feelings are coming from, uh, you can really help kids and uh, and adults get to the root of what they're suffering from. Yeah. And what's interesting there is that there's real important knowledge that we have to have. Um, emotions have these underlying causes or themes. Uh, So, for example, anxiety is around uncertainty. Fear is around impending danger. Anger is about perceptions of injustice, disappointment around unmet expectations. And so when we're asking the question, like, tell me more, what we as the adults have to do for our kids or our friends, our colleagues, our partners, is literally listen for those themes because then we could start helping people to label their feelings accurately. So let, let's talk about some of those strategies. I, I know if, if, if my research is correct, uh, you are primarily responsible for the ruler method. Is that, is that correct? Am I reading that right? That's correct. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I first discovered this, I was blown away because it was so much, I, again, relating to my own childhood, I just kept thinking, this is what I needed growing up. And we, you know, in getting our kids into schools, we uh, interviewed a bunch of different schools. 
and many of them uh, use this method, and I was really excited about it. Can you tell us a little bit about what Ruler is or, or maybe some other strategies that people can use to, uh, to I guess, uh, identify those emotions and learn to, to cope with them? Well, Ruler is an acronym for the five skills of emotional intelligence. And the first one is recognition of emotion. So just being highly perceptive, like what's going on in my body and my mind right now? Do I feel energized? Do I feel depleted? Do I feel pleasant? Do I feel unpleasant? And just making meaning out of that. The second skill is understanding of emotion. So why am I feeling this way? Like, what happened? Again, thinking about, like, did I just get bad news? Am I afraid of something in the future? Do I have, you know, am I disappointed because, you know, I didn't get what I thought, you know, was going to happen? Um, and that all helps us kind of recognize, understand, and label. Those are the first three skills. So it's pleasant, unpleasant, you know, reasons why, and language. And that gives us what we call the experience of emotion. And then the E and the R of ruler tell us what to do. So firstly, do I have permission to express my feelings? Is my colleague, my son, my daughter, my parent going to listen to me? Um, do I know how to communicate this feeling? And then the last one, which is the one I think all of us struggle with the most, is the regulation. So what can I do to prevent this feeling from happening again if it's not wanted uh, or reduce the feeling right now so I can have the conversation? Uh, those are the regulation strategies. So I, I want to ask a, a little bit more detail about the recognizing emotions in oneself. I, yeah. um, my entire life, I guess I've suffered from anxiety and I never had a name for it until roughly about a year ago. And, and what I consider just normal, um, everyday thinking process was, was off the charts anxiety. And I had it, it really surprised me to put a name to the feeling. And I, that was the moment that I recognized, you know, this particular feeling. But, you know, prior to that, I had no idea how, you know, for somebody who doesn't really, can't really recognize emotions, I mean, what are some of the things that they can do to uncover what they actually are feeling and put a name to it? So I think what's important is you have to really sit back and take a breath, right, and start evaluating, like, what is happening for me right now? So the, I'm, I'm, I grew up, you know, very anxious myself, um, and I always thought I had an anxiety disorder. Um, and then, interestingly enough, you know, at my own institution, which is, you know, a huge famous medical school, I go to the doctor, and he's like, here's some Ativan, and here's some Prilosec for your heartburn, and you'll be fine. And I was pissed, <laughs> because I was like, that's, you know, that's the treatment. Um and then I started just like really evaluating, like stressed. When you're stressed out, it means there's, you've got too many demands and not enough resources. And I was thinking, actually, I'm pretty resilient. I don't think I'm stressed. Anxiety, well, I'm not that uncertain about the future. I feel pretty certain things are going pretty well for me. Oh, okay, I'm not anxious. And then all of a sudden I had this aha moment. I was overwhelmed because I was putting myself, you know, on, in meetings from 7 a.m. till 10 p.m. I was trains in meetings and planes in meetings. And I realized that unless I took things off my plate, I was never going to feel better. And it was such a major aha for me in my life because I literally labeled that I was overwhelmed and that I had too many things on my plate. And from then on, I had strategies to regulate it. It's funny. I've had a similar experience just with my depression. I've always, um, it's always just been this cloud that hung over me as depression. It's this thing and there's nothing I can do about it. I just have to learn how to, you know, deal when it strikes and that, and that sort of thing. But becoming familiar with the term overwhelm, it made this connection for me that so often I would get overwhelmed by responsibilities and, and life in general. And I would get to a point where I would shut down. And to me, that was that was always depression. And I know now that I'm basically just short circuiting from overwhelm and I'm better able to say to say no to things that would otherwise lead me to that uh, and found other strategies. And it is just from that being able to name it. I think you even said to name it, to tame it. Uh, that strategy yeah, it's is so important. Fire. You know, a lot of my students at Yale say they're stressed, they're stressed. And then when I interview them, I realize, A, Actually, they're under a lot of pressure because of their parents texting them constantly and checking in on them all the time. 
or they're actually feeling envious because they're observing everybody in their surroundings. Hey, that one's smarter than I am. That one's going to get better grades than I do. That one's going to have more opportunities than I have. And yet our solutions are so simple. It's like go to a mindfulness class or go to a yoga class, which, by the way, are important to do. But if you're feeling envious every day, you know, through observ- observing everyone in your surroundings and thinking everyone's going to be better off than you are, you need a lot more than breathing exercises. Right. You really need to work on your cognitive strategies. Well, and, and then amplify that into the, you know, outside the, the school campus to social media. I mean, that's it exists primarily yeah. to make us jealous of each other. I've worked with so many high school students who, you know, have distorted their uh, images online to make themselves look better. And they think that's going to make them feel better. And it works the opposite because they realize very quickly that the way they've presented themselves online is not the way they look in the real world. And it actually makes them feel worse. So, you know, how we think things are going to make us feel uh, oftentimes doesn't correlate with how we will actually feel. I'm, you know, I'm just curious in, in, in your, in your work, you know, this, um, from a, from a male perspective, you know, the, the permission to feel is, um, is, has generally not been there my entire life. And I think it's just starting to kind of hit mainstream. Um, you know, what, what is your take on how society is starting to adopt this ability for people to, to actually acknowledge their feelings? Um, I may be asking another way is, is, is it starting to become okay for guys to get vulnerable and be sensitive and, and be safe about it? That's my goal, you know, in terms of my book is to, just put out there that emotions are information and they're not good or bad. They're just information. And if we don't use them wisely, right, they become destructive, right, to ourselves and to our relationships. Um, But unfortunately, even in society today, um, you know, a man feeling shame, a man feeling anxious or fearful, right, that's perceived as being weak. Some, a male, a one man said to me after a presentation recently, he goes, God, you're so open about your childhood and your bullying and, you know, all that kind of thing. He goes, I would, I actually was bullied as a kid, but I would never tell my child I was bullying because then my child would think I was weak and couldn't protect him. And I said to him, well, what if your child is being bullied right now? And your mindset is I would never have an open conversation with him sharing my own story. Where does it leave your kid? And... So I think it is so important for us to just move away from this mindset that, you know, negative emotions make men weak and just recognize that we all have feelings and emotions. They're not good or bad. They're information. And we want to use them wisely to achieve our goals. All right, that's Dr. Mark Brackett. He is the founding director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. He's the author of the book, Permission to Feel, Unlocking the Power of Emotions to Help Our Kids, Ourselves, and Our Society Thrive. Uh, It's a good read. You should definitely pick it up. There's a link on our website, thefitmess.com. I want to touch a little bit on what he was talking about in terms of kids and and their emotions. This is something, you know, it's so interesting being a parent because it really is just experiment after experiment after experiment. And As I have been looking inward and trying to process my emotions, process my feelings, learn what they are, learn how to deal with them, uh, I'm I'm having to make an even bigger effort to give my kids the room to have their own feelings and help them figure out how to identify them and how to deal with them, which is really difficult to learn how to do for yourself and teach your kids about at the same time. I don't I don't have necessarily negative memories as a kid of, of feeling like I wasn't you know, given space to, to feel, I don't remember being told to toughen up. I'm sure I was, but I don't, I don't remember being shut down, but on some level I must've been because that is how I learned to, uh, how to cope. That's how I learned how to, how to exist and and survive. And I do see that pattern repeating with my kids at times where, you know, they'll, they'll be upset about something, something really kind of insignificant, you know, as far as, my point of view, uh, you know, a dropped piece of candy, uh, you know, an argument over whose, you know, rock they got at the beach and who it belongs to, whatever. And it just seems really insignificant. But when you do take the time to not just go, guys, it's just a rock, get over it, you know, or just put it down or I'm going to take it away or whatever. 
if you do have the time and you take the time to get to the root of what are the feelings that you're having over whatever this thing is, it's amazing how quickly they can can sort through it and, and move on rather than arguing about the story, the insignificant thing that's happening that's triggering a, a deeper issue. Yeah, I've got a perfect example of that this week with my daughter. Um, I came downstairs, she was eating breakfast and she had, she was eating Cheerios and she was crying. I'm like, okay, we, all right, the day is going to start like this. Yeah. But, you know, I was like, hey, what's wrong? And something was muttered about, you know, I, I wanted coconut milk and all we had was regular milk. And it was at that moment where I could have just said, it's milk, get over it. Right. Stop crying. This It's stupid to cry over something like that. Yeah. But I had this moment of, that's a lot of tears over milk. Something else is going on here. So I, I started probing a little bit more and she turns out like she had a dream about all of her friends back in Seattle and she was sad and was missing them. So, I mean, that had nothing to do with milk, but like I had that moment where I could have just shut her down. Yeah. And I, you know, like I pat myself on the back. I'm really proud of the fact that I recognized it um, because we were able to, you know, talk about it. And we hugged it out and did a couple of, you know, video calls with friends back in Seattle and and dealt with the underlying emotion that was actually making her sad. Right. And it was it was amazing. It was like a it was a made me cry because I wanted that as a kid. That that on its own is a powerful story. And I think it's one that there are a lot of parents, I would hope, are, that are listening that are going, I've been in that situation. I've had that happen. And when we've got to be out the door in nine minutes, I don't have time for this. I don't have time mm -hmm. to talk you through your feelings or whatever. But I would challenge anyone, and this is a challenge to myself as well, that in that situation, weigh the lesson you can teach your kid about what they feel over being on time to class or you know being at the birthday party on time or whatever the thing is that that because of the story you've told yourself is important about being on time or being where you need to be at a certain place weigh that against the lesson you're teaching your kid about how to really feel what they're feeling and and manage it uh and and I think the choice becomes pretty obvious it's not yeah. easy that's not an easy thing to do because we all get caught up in the short amount of time we have in the day to get in all the things got, we have to do. You got to be on time. Yeah. But there's got to be a balance there. You've got to, you've got to find the time. And I remember when I first started learning about uh, social emotional learning, that it's something like if you can do it 30% of the time, you're winning. Like that's if, if three <laughs> out of 10 times you can take the time and do it right. That's a win because most, mm -hmm. most cases it's zero. Very, yeah. very rarely do people take the time to actually process what's important over whatever the story is you're telling yourself. Yep. One of the questions that we asked Dr. Brackett was, you know, if if it's OK for guys to be mindful of their feelings. And I I was happy to hear that that's his mission. It just to, to keep going with this, like I had a, a training at work and it was about, you know, how to be a better leader. And we spent half of a day talking about mindset and emotional intelligence. And it just blew me away that it's not taboo anymore. Like this is what people are pitching and recommending is to be intelligent about your emotions, be able to recognize them, be able to read others and deal with them in a way that lets them deal with theirs. It's just, it was really exciting to, to see that that's becoming mainstream and that's yeah that's mind blowing to me to hear that they're that they're pre not only teaching but preaching that in in a corporate environment is that's mind blowing yeah I've, I've been reading a couple of books on it lately and you know it's you know if you take two people with the same technical ability to get a job done and one has emotional intelligence and the other one doesn't the one with emotional intelligence is going to be far superior mm-hmm yeah, being able to read other people's emotions by way of recognizing your own emotions is just a, a really useful skill to have. And whether, you know, it's people at work or just strangers on the street or your kids or whatever, it's just everyone has them and everyone's processing them. 
and if you can recognize them, you can you can deal with them. Well, and something that you know, I had to sort of remind myself, despite the numerous conversations you and I have had, and the tons of hours and money I've spent with a therapist. So much of it, for me anyways, especially just even in the last few weeks, ties back to a lesson I was reminded of. I, I just read a book that you know sort of focuses on some of this stuff. And the, the, the thing I keep telling myself when times are tough and I'm, not, I'm struggling to take the time and do it right and all that is just trying to remind myself to deal with what is and not what should be. Because so often... The thing, the the suffering that we put up with, the 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 struggle that we create for ourselves, is because we have an idea of the way things are supposed to be. You're not supposed to walk down the stairs and see your kid crying into her bowl of cereal and coconut milk in the morning. You're supposed to walk down to, <laughs> "Good morning, Daddy. Good morning, mm-hmm. daughter. How are you today? I'm fantastic and excited for school. Great, daughter. I'm excited for a day at work. You know that's." <laughs> That's what we all learned is is supposed to happen is this cheerful good morning and everything's supposed to be great. And when you deal with it from wh- whatever the situation is, when you when you come at it from this is not how it's supposed to be, it's going to be way harder to deal with it on an emotionally intelligent level than to just go my kids crying and I need to know why. That's all mm-hmm. I need to do right now. Nothing else matters. Whatever yeah. whatever the thing is, the the project at work that you're working on, don't worry about the thing that's due on your boss's de- desk next Thursday. Worry about the thing in front of you right now. And it's amazing how just sort of repeating that to myself as almost a, a mantra lately has helped me identify where am I right now, what is needed of me right now. And if I just give everything I have to that, everything else kind of falls into place. And I'm not saying not to set goals and not have ideas of where you're going. But, the you know, <laughs> again, now is all you have. Everything else is is a memory or an imagination. So if you can start there, I think that opens a lot of doors to developing and and growing your emotional intelligence. That that's really funny that you you say it that way because not not to get all Tim Ferriss, but I've been pondering a a, a quote from a stoic um or I guess he's a stoic, Marcus Aurelius and I've got it as isn't, the background, isn't he? What's ki- isn't he King Stoic? <laughs> Essentially, yes. <laughs> yeah. I guess he's a he. Amongst other things, he's a Stoic. Yes. Um, but the quote um, that I've been pondering and I've been reading every day, and it's really been kind of helping me dial it in a little bit at work. Um, is it's just a quote that says, "Yes, you can if you do everything as if it were the last thing you were doing in your life." And stop being aimless. Stop letting your emotions override what your mind tells you. Stop being hypocritical, self-centered, irritable. Um, I, I've been reading this every day, and it's just, you know, minus the the letting your emotions override. It just allows me to focus in on what's going on right now, yep. what's going on in my body, what emotions I'm feeling, where I'm hung up. And it's, it's the whole mindfulness. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, argument. It's a, it's amazing how many of these conversations we've had with uh, various people from various backgrounds with different you know expertise, and so often it just comes back to where your mind's at with whether it's meditation, diet, exercise, feelings, whatever. If you can just be more aware of where you are right now, what you're feeling right now, what's required of you right now, everything else gets easier. Yep. All right. Well, it sounds like you're doing a good job with your kid uh, in terms of discussing ha, her feelings, ha, your ha. feelings. Sounds like you're an oh, old that, pro. You got yeah, that, this. That specifically. So all I, I heard the beginning part. Sounds like you're doing a good job with your kid. And I was like, I'm I'm going with like a 30 percent success rate like you were talking about earlier. That's that's solid. That's counted I'm as happy with 30 percent. So I was going to challenge you uh, or for our, our challenge of the week, I guess. Uh, I was going to suggest that at least once per week, because we typically go a couple weeks between shows, having a real conversation with your kid about emotions. And, Done. And, and, <laughs> and I know that sounds simple, but I don't want it to be the analogy that you gave of in crisis, break down what's going on. Find a quiet yep. moment when everything's fine. And and see where, where she's at. And, I, and I'll try and do the same with mine and just talk to them about feelings and share some of what I'm feeling. And, you know, as, as a, you know, dad who's trying to figure it all out or whatever, 
just I challenge you to at least once per week just get open with your kid and try and uh, engage uh, on on that level and and identify what you're what you're both feeling. And that and that's it's a you know I mean we we talked about the challenge beforehand, but like it's really hitting me in the moment as as you're saying it that you know this kind of stuff doesn't really come up around the good stuff. It's right. only when we're talking about processing the negative things. Yeah, yeah. And that's part of what, what uh, Dr. Brackett was talking about is his uncle that just asked him, how are you feeling? And how that not only like gave him the, the help that he needed in the moment, but that sent him down this career where he's now running a whole department focused on that study at Yale. I mean, that simple question. So mm. who knows what, what it could mean to your kid, Zach, or listener, uh, or your spouse, your parent, what it, just find someone and have that conversation. Talk about how you're feeling in that moment. Find out how they're feeling and just connect on that level. Put the phone down for 10 minutes. Turn the TV off, whatever, and just <gasps> no. find that moment. That's my challenge for you for this week. That's a good challenge. I'll take it. All right. And I will do the same. Uh, nice. And with that, I believe we are just about out of time. We should make sure that we tell you all about our fantastic sponsors. Of course, Bravest Brewing Company. They make some of the best non-alcoholic beer you can find on the market. Zach, you just had some of the new ones. Yeah, I I, I saw an email from Bravest saying that they had um, a special flavor called their white ale. And I was like, I'm down. So I ordered a bunch of it. And uh, I have to say that like it's a little bit late summer, but it's, it's a good summer beer. Mm. Um, it was... It was really delicious. I mean, my wife tried it. She is generally not a big beer fan, but she even liked it. It was great. I actually, I saw some people writing uh, online. We're in part of a a, a Facebook group that enjoys non-alcoholic beers. And I saw lots of of people raving about that one. There's also like a raspberry uh, gose, I believe is how you say it. And uh, lots of rave reviews for that as well. If you want to try and get your hands on those or any of their other beers, you can use our discount code FITMESS10. Uh, go to their website, which you can get to through our website, thefitmess.com, and you'll get a, a discount on your order. And also a quick uh, shout-out to Bulletproof Coffee. There's a, a, a link also on our website where you can get uh, the latest deals on the various Bulletproof products. I, I know I can't have uh, my day start without my at least one or two cups of Bulletproof Coffee. It's a, a big piece of my sort of daily routine, and so uh, if that's something you've been thinking about trying out, Go to our website, click the link, and, and buy the stuff, and it helps support us and helps support them, and it's a, it's a beautiful thing. It all works out the way it's supposed to. Uh, it's or, beautiful. Or just the way it is, not the way it's supposed to, depending on your point of view, <laughs> I guess. Uh, that's it for us for now. We are going to take off for a couple of weeks. We will be back at thefitmess.com. Thanks for listening, and most importantly, thanks for sharing this episode or telling your friends or doing whatever you can to spread the word. If this is something you're into and you know someone else that would also be into it, that's the best way to help grow this little show into what we hope it will be one day. Thanks so much for listening. We will see you in a couple of weeks at thefitmess.com. See you, everyone. We know this podcast is amazing and does not seem to lack anything, but we still need a legal disclaimer. Jeremy and Zach are not doctors. Please consult your physician prior to implementing any changes that you heard on this podcast. The listener assumes that Jeremy and Zach do not know what they're talking about and that you'll do your own research on the topics talked about in this podcast. The hosts of this podcast are not liable for any physical or emotional issues that might occur directly or indirectly as a result of listening to this podcast.